Good. Now we have a slight change to the um, advertised program. Um, you'll see we we're expecting Dominic Stevens, Chief Economist from Westpac, this morning. He's been called to a meeting with the Minister of Finance. Um, make of that what you will. Um, but um, his colleague, uh, Felix Delbrook, has stepped up to the mark and is going to um, fill in for Dominic. I talked to Felix in, in the break. And he assured me they're not like typical economists, at least as far as housing goes. They do agree on matters of substance. Um, Felix worked in um, the um, Reserve Bank as a, an analysis um, expert on modelling and forecasting. And um, he joined Westpac as a senior economist in 2011. Felix is going to give us um, a financial perspective on house prices um, and hopefully a little bit of analysis and um, idea about how we can um, manage the rising tide of house prices. So if I could ask Felix to come to the stage. Uh, thanks, Lee, um, and thanks for welcoming me here. Look, um, you've heard from a variety of uh, perspectives about Auckland housing today. I'm going to give you a slightly different perspective. Um, I'm going to give you a, a financial perspective. My main point today is going to be that we really can't understand what's happened to the Auckland housing market without thinking about the financial environment and specifically about mortgage rates. So, before I get into the housing market, though, I think I need to give you a bit of context about um, mortgage rates themselves and why they're now rising. So I won't spend too much time on this. Um, uh, most of you will be well aware of what the main themes are. But look, uh, at the risk of oversimplifying, um, we've got three main things going on in the New Zealand economy at the moment. And of course, the first one, and maybe the biggest one, is, is, is the... The, the Canterbury rebuild. Um, so um, our perspective on that is um, it's, it's pretty similar to um, what you'll hear from people at the Reserve Bank or at the Treasury. Um, we've got about 30 to $40 billion worth of building to do um, over this decade. Um, so it's pretty massive. Um, our view is that the peak of the activity associated with that uh, will come in, in, in late 2015. And at the moment, we are, we're not at that peak yet, um, but we're getting, uh, we're getting closer to it. So the Canterbury rebuild is, 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 is a very big thing in the economy at the moment. Just to give you a perspective on what it means for the economy, um, this is um, our forecast for the share of total house building in the economy. Now, if it wasn't for the Canterbury rebuild, we'd probably be forecasting something pretty average, um, and other things would have to be doing the heavy lifting. With the Canterbury rebuild, we're looking at something approaching uh, the kind of house building boom we saw in the mid-2000s. So that gives you some perspective. Um, the rest of that building that we're forecasting, that's mostly Auckland. So, of course, I'm going to get back to that later on. Now, that's not all that's going on. The second main theme in the economy has been, um, well, you could call it the dairy boom. It's, it's, it's not just been about dairy. We've also seen it in, in, in lamb and beef. Um, but dairy has, of course, been the main thing that people have been watching. Um, look, dairy had a sweet spot this year um, because part of what happened was, to, was due to low supplies in New Zealand and, and elsewhere. So we saw extremely high prices until very recently. Um, I don't think prices are going to last at those kinds of levels. In fact, they've, they've come off recently um, at global auctions, as we, as we all know. Um, but some of what's been going on is, is, is rising demand in emerging markets. And that's a longer term good news story. And what it means is um, a higher standard of living for New Zealanders that we might have expected as, as recently as, as 10 years ago. So this is the second bit of good news on top of um, all the building that's going on at the moment. As I said, this year was probably a sweet spot. Um, so a lot of growth at the moment is being concentrated in the present time. 
but this is an additional driver of the upswing we've seen. And you can see it coming through in stronger confidence, which is basically spreading it through the rest of the economy. Um, in line with that drop in dairy prices and maybe with the recent rise in mortgage rates as well, confidence has come off a little bit in the last few months, um, but you can see it's still at extremely high levels. And of course, that's resulted in more investment by businesses generally and stronger consumer spending as well. So, look, if we just had those two things going on, uh, we'd be forecasting economic growth north of 5%, um, and the Reserve Bank would be raising um, interest rates to the kinds of levels we saw back in 2007 when floating mortgage rates went north of 10%. Um, now, we're not in that space, um, and that's because of the third major driver of the economy. Um, uh, and that's basically the, the, the weak rest of the world. So um, the, the, the phrase, the rock star economy, that's been bandied, bandied about a whole lot lately. And what the people who talk about that really mean is that New Zealand is un looking unusually good compared to um, its trading partners. Um, and of course, that includes countries like uh, the US and Europe, which is still recovering very slowly from the global financial crisis. Um, but very unusually, it also includes Australia. And I just want to show you these two charts because um, they boil it down to the, to the two drivers, the, uh, the commodity boom and the construction boom that I've been talking about. They give you another sense of the scale of what we're going through. Um, and you can see how, um, how we are out of sync with, with Australia at the moment. So this is our estimate of the... Um, of the New Zealand Canterbury reconstruction boom. It's basically um, a version of the chart I showed you before. And overlaid on top of that, I've got our estimate of the, um, the, the Australian mining boom, the mining investment boom. Um, and you can see that what we're going through is not quite as big as what they went through, but it's getting close. Um, and importantly, we're out of sync. So our reconstruction boom has been ramping up over the last couple of years, just as their uh, mining boom has started to wind down. And you can see a similar, a similar kind of a, a, a phase shift in terms of um, our export pictures. Um, so the terms of trade is another word. It's, it's basically a summary measure of um, market conditions, export market conditions for an economy. Um, for New Zealand, it's largely driven by things like dairy and meat prices. For Australia, it's largely driven by coal and iron ore prices. Um, and you can see that our recent um, commodity boom hasn't been anywhere near as big as theirs has. Um, but importantly, we've been going in different directions of late. So as the Chinese economy has rotated away from lots of investment-led growth towards more sustainable consumption-driven growth, that's been bad news for iron ore exporters in Australia. It's been good news for dairy and meat exporters. Now, even with this correction in dairy prices we've seen recently, um, that, that would amount to a little bit of a blip in that New Zealand terms of trade line. Uh, whereas you can see that the correction in Australia has been much bigger than that. So, so that's where we are with respect to Australia. We're looking unusually healthy. They're look, not looking so flash. That's affected the economy in lots of more or less um, obvious ways. One way is migration, which I'll come back to later on. Um, but probably the, the, the biggest and most important way is that um, inflation has been lower than it normally would be because of cheap import prices and because of the high New Zealand dollar, which is a reflected uh, New Zealand's rock star economy status. Um, now, to date, um, that's, or until very recently, that um, kept interest rates at, at extremely low levels. Um, that's now started to change. Um, but, but, but it means that what we're talking about when we're talking about the Reserve Bank now raising interest rates as confidence has risen and as the, uh, the construction boom has really got underway is, is something pretty modest compared to previous cycles. So back in 2007, floating mortgage rates went north of 10%. Uh, we're thinking that um, they might reach about 8% at the peak this time. 
So, of course, that's still quite a bit higher than they've been recently. So, uh, we're expecting um, the Reserve Bank to raise interest rates by about two percentage points by the end of uh, next year um, and about three percentage points by the end of 2016. Um, up to 2015, that's broadly in line with what the financial markets have priced in. So, of course, the, the result of that has been that you've seen fixed-term mortgage rates go up. Um, beyond that, I think markets are still underpricing the risk that, that this, this can, thing could be a bit bigger cycle um, uh, uh, than, the, the, uh, than, than, the, than they've bargained for. But so that's the, that's the financial context. That's the kind of interest rate rises we are looking at. So what does that mean for the housing market? Look, I think it's uh, useful to break New Zealand's housing market into three groups. Um, of course, that's too simple, but I think you can, it's, it's helpful to do that. Um, so we've got Christchurch, uh, we've got Auckland, and we've got the rest of the country. Um, now, obviously, Christchurch and Auckland house prices have both been going through the roof. We've had about 20% rises over the last two years, and we haven't seen anything near that in the rest of the country. So there's an obvious difference there. Um, but to understand the difference between Auckland and Christchurch, you can't just look at prices. You also have to look at what rents have been doing. And that's where the gap between Auckland and Christchurch really shows up. Um, Christchurch has be, been behaving like a classic uh, housing shortage uh, scenario. So you've seen prices going through the roof and you've also seen rents going through the roof as everybody's been scrambling to find somewhere to live. Um, Auckland, very surprisingly, hasn't looked like that at all. So prices have also been going through the roof. Um, but as you can see there, um, rents have barely moved more than they have in Wellington which is rather puzzling. Now, that's not because we don't have a housing shortage in Auckland. I'm not going to get, come up here and say that we don't have one. You can't deny it. And the easiest way of just tracking that shortage is to look at the average number of people per house um, in Auckland versus other places. Um, now, in most parts of New Zealand, people per house has been trending down over time. That's just due to demographic factors, smaller families, um, uh, population aging and the like. Um, Auckland's typically had a higher number of people per house, um, and our um, historical trends have been flatter. That's because Auckland's population is younger and because we've got more migrants. Um, but what's really been absolutely at odds with historical trends is what's happened in Auckland in the last five to six years since 2008. So because we've had continued population growth um, and, and, and very little building after the financial crisis, uh, we've seen that ratio go up. Now that's very unusual um, and uh, it really doesn't look, look sustainable. So that's a way of representing the shortage that we're talking about. Um, now, what kind of progress have we made to date in alleviating that shortage? Our estimate is that that, get, that, that lift there, so if you think of that as the shortage, that amounts to about 14,000 houses in total. Um, so that's kind of the gap that we've got to fill. Simply to get that trend gently going down again, you'd need to have annual building rising to maybe 6,000 houses, sorry, 9,000 houses a year. So that's kind of what we're talking about, just to reverse that trend in a gentle fashion. Um, at the trough, um, Auckland house building was about 4,500 houses a year. I think that was in early 2012. Um, we've made some progress since then. So at the end of last year, that had risen to 6,000 houses a year. Um, I don't know what it's like now, but we do know that um, the value of house building rose about another 10% in the first quarter of this year. So we've gone a fair way. Um, we still have quite a long way to go to reach, even to reach that 9,000 mark. Um, 
Look, I don't, um, you're going to be the experts on, 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 on what's been behind the improvement that we've been seeing. Um, and anecdotally, it looks like the special housing zones have been making a difference. Um, that's what people have been telling us. Um, and I, I think a, a part of the response has simply be, uh, has, to, has to be due to the, the fact that house prices in Auckland have risen so much um, as well because people follow where the money is. But um, so we're, we're, we're really at a minimum talking about 9,000 houses. Um, it's going to have to be more to that to get a more, uh, a, a more decisive fall in that, in that population ratio. Um, and of course, the other thing we've got going on at the moment is a, is a migration boom. Um, nationwide migration is, is at levels now that we've not seen since the early 2000s. Um, and as I said before, that's largely due to that disconnect between New Zealand and Australia that we've got going on at the moment. So most of these migrants that we've, um, or this turnaround in migration that we've been seeing, it's not really um, foreign migrants coming in as such, though of course we've, we've had those continuing to come into Auckland. Most of it's trans-Tasman, so you're talking about fewer New Zealanders going to Australia, more, more New Zealanders coming back, and more Australians moving to New Zealand as well. Um, so that's why I don't think this migration boom will last. Eventually the Australian economy will, will, will grow more strongly and eventually New Zealand will slow once the, minor, the, the, the reconstruction boom peaks. Um, so we're not talking about something long lived here, uh, but of course in the short, short term, um, it's certainly not helping with those housing pressures, pressures we are facing. So that's our take on the housing shortage in Auckland. Basically there is one, um, we've made a good start at alleviating it, but we've got further to go. So um, that's not very controversial at all. So it brings me back to the question, why has New Zealand's housing market not behaved like the Christchurch one? Um, look, what I think, part of it has to be, part of it has to be speculation. Um, you've got very sharply rising prices, you've got very little movement in rents, and what that obviously means is that landlords are willing to accept um, quite a sharp compression in yields. So that's a fact. Um, I don't know what's driving that. <coughs> Clearly, there's got to be a, uh, the expectation that um, shortages will get even worse in the future. Um, but I think um, at least part of the reason why we've had this compression in yields um, is, is the fact that mortgage rates have also been so low. Um, and you can see that uh, 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 nationwide <laughs> over history, the New Zealand housing market's actually very responsive to where, where mortgage rates go. So typically when mortgage rates rise rapidly, you get the housing market cooling. Um, and when mortgage rates fall, as they did um, after, after the Canterbury earthquake in 2011, um, you get housing markets accelerating. And I think that's at least part of what we've seen going on this time. Um, the unusual thing has been that it's been so concentrated in Auckland, and that's why I think that, that there's got to be this extra uh, speculative element in there as well. So if you take that perspective on things, um, obviously that, 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 that might make you a little bit concerned. So there's, there's the risk that we could see a correction in the Auckland market as interest rates start to rise. Uh, there's a risk that we might see um, overbuilding if prices have risen too far. So there's a risk of a boom bust scenario. Um, and of course there's financial risks there too around people getting into too much debt and what that might do to the financial system. So it's, it's, it's that last risk that the Reserve Bank was addressing when it introduced its lending restrictions um, on low equity lending in October last year. And that's, uh, that's actually provided us with quite an interesting natural experiment on the housing market um, because, um, of course, we've, over that time, we've also had this, this surge in migration, but we've also had quite a significant tightening in financial conditions as it's become harder for first-home buyers to get into the housing market ladder. And, of course, we've lately seen mortgage rates rise as well. Um, and I think what we've seen today supports the idea that, that financial conditions are really quite important in understanding the market. 
um, you can see that since October the market has co cooled quite noticeably. So house sales in Auckland are down about 10% from last September. Um, the inventory of homes for sale has risen. Um, prices, it's a bit more opaque um, because there's sort of issues with the composition of the market. But I think overall we can say that prices have kept growing but at a, at a, at a slightly slower pace as well. So the, the slowdown in the market has started to affect price action. Um, just on those lending restrictions, those LVR restrictions, um, the Reserve Bank said it's comfortable with where they are, with, with where they are, um, and they don't plan to start phasing them out till uh, the end of the year at the earliest. Um, but it's worth noting that banks have gone quite a bit harder than they needed to under the restrictions. So that's what this chart is showing. Um, the, the Reserve Bank speed limit um, was... Um, the simplest one was about 15% of new lending being uh, high LVR, um, and we've fallen way below that. Um, now, banks have been trying to get that ratio up a bit. Um, they've not really succeeded so far. Um, if they do over time, um, then we could see uh, the housing market see a little bit of a second wind as the year goes on. But um, importantly, um, I don't think that that would be a long-run development, and the reason for that is, again, the rising interest rates. So but this is our forecast for the nationwide housing market. I'm sorry we don't forecast Auckland specifically, but obviously Auckland is a bit, big driver of this. So, um, look, we're, we're not talking about a collapse in prices here, but what we are talking about is a slowing market over the next couple of years, uh, and by the second half of the decade, um, as interest rates are higher and the economy is probably slower as well, once the uh, Canterbury rebuild peaks, we could be talking about a sustained period where prices are flat to falling. So uh, that's, our, that's our view on housing. And it's, it's, it's not based on a shortage or absence of a shortage. It's based on the fact that house prices... Um, really would look quite overvalued now um, as an investment um, if mortgage rates were at more normal levels. So that's really it um, uh, uh, in, a, in a nutshell. Um, so to summarize, we, we've, we've got a shortage in Auckland. Uh, we've made progress, but we need to do more. Um, but that shortage hasn't been very well reflected in the price signals in Auckland. So we've had prices rising by more than I think is warranted by the shortage, and we've seen rents rising by less. Um, now, I'm reasonably confident that that imbalance will unwind as um, mortgage rates continue to um, rise back to more normal levels. Of course, the tricky thing is, is, is forecasting exactly how that will happen. Um, I think the risks are um, in the direction of a correction to house prices. Um, typically, house prices have been a lot more variable than rents have been. Um, and I think those risks will be especially um, salient um, if the economy cools in the second half of the decade. Um, but some of, the, some of the adjustment might come through, through higher rents also. Um, so what does it mean for all of us? Look, as, as individuals, I think we, we also all have to be aware of the risks uh, that we face that the housing market could, could uh, correct um, in coming years. Um, I think if we're thinking about uh, construction, the, the lesson from all of this is we want to encourage more building but in a, in a controlled and sustainable way because on the one hand... The obvious risk here is that we could see overbuilding in the boom-bust scenario, and I don't think anybody would want that. Um, but on the other hand, it's clear that there's more, uh, there's, there's more building that needs to be done, um, and what we don't want is house prices holding up uh, and rents doing all of the adjustment and renters being squeezed. Um, that wouldn't be desirable either. So um, that's the upshot. Uh, thank you for listening to me, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Felix.